So, okay, my name is Alexander Freeman, and I'm the vice chair of the SIBSI Southwest Committee. And I'm absolutely delighted to present to you today to genuine thought leaders in the industry um, of 3D printed building. This is a collaborative event with the IET and SIBSI, and we've both been working very closely the last few months to bring you the absolute best content um, available anywhere, we believe. So first, we're going to have a speaker from the IET side who is going to cover state of the art technology development. And our second presentation is going to be brought to you by SIBSI, who is going to cover more of the academic applications side. And after each presentation, both of our speakers have kindly offered to uh, take some questions from uh, people in attendance. But firstly, it's an absolute honour and a privilege to introduce our first speaker. Henrik Lundielsen is the general manager of Cobod International, uh, who develop uh, industry leading technology for 3D printed housing. Um, we could spend a very long time going over his decorated CV, but I think the thing that stands out most for me is in 2020, he was recognised as one of the most 10 influential executives worldwide in the 3D printed uh, space. So um, without further ado, um, I'd like to hand over to Henrik and allow him to uh, provide his presentation. So um, if you would like to share your screen, Henrik. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Alex. Uh, yes, I am Henrik Lund Nilsson, not just Henrik. I'm known to, as Henrik uh, to everybody. So I am the founder and general manager of, uh, of Cobot. And uh, my background is an MBA, so I am, you know, I'm sort of playing with the enemy here because you guys are all technical and I'm all about business. But uh, don't worry, I have technical understanding, understanding enough to be able to cover your, even your technical questions. So I call this uh, presentation from research of state of the art to becoming state of the art because our start was in fact that we did three years of research before we started to be commercial ourselves. And today we do believe, in all honesty, that we are state of the art, that we are clearly globally the leading company providing these printers uh, on a global scale. Now, as I hinted at uh, a little bit while we were waiting for the last participants, um, the, 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 the interest for this has grown exponentially the last uh, three to six months. And one of the reasons is uh, what has been happening in Germany, where they built a, a three printed a two story house first and then a three story house. And um, Perry, uh, our partner in Germany, um, um, issued this video, uh, our long version of this video. You, uh, I'm now prepared a short version of it because the original version is 20 minutes. So that would take up on all the time on its own. And so this this uh, this this uh, video is uh, three minutes long, and you should be able to hear what is being said on the video. If not, so please let me know. Alex, can you just confirm that you can hear? Um, I can't hear anything, I'm afraid, Henry. Ah. Should we try uh, uh, playing it from your computer instead, because you're the organizer? Um, I can otherwise, try and pull this otherwise up. Otherwise, I will simply say what is being said uh, uh, you know, as fast as I can. I, I think that might be the best. The most okay. expedient thing to do, Henrik, yeah, because okay. it might take me so, a, a little while to pull it up. Okay, okay, don't worry. So I'll try to, I'll, let's say, I'll, I'll give you the gist of it. Uh, not, not maybe the whole thing, but then because they are doing saying a lot of things, but uh, but I'll give you the main thing. Then. Okay. With the promise of cutting waste, uh, uh, reducing time, and solving the labor uh, shortage, printing, uh, printing buildings are starting to appear around the world, including in Dubai, where they have decided to really print 25% of all buildings within 2030. 
the confusion of this uh, 3D printer building might change the picture that we have seen so far. It's been that there has not been a massive uptake of the technology. The single family uh, house, 160 square meters, one two four. First printed building in Germany that has been permitted. Smashing a major barrier, uh, hindering uh, growth. Homes were both built in Alpinter, but two from Cobra. You can get it in various sizes. Printer can print a meter per second. So all electric appliances, etc., circuits have been pre-planned, and thus the, the printer is taking that into uh, consideration when it's printing. Kind of real world things have seen. Integration of multiple functions has huge impact. When the electrician came in and saw the building, he said, "I will save twelve days here because." Been prepared. Very significant what you can also see in savings for other for other trades than the just wall. Uh, Henrik, I'm very sorry, but it seems that the audio on your end is not coming through very clearly. Um, I don't know if it's buffering I, due to the oh, video. Yeah, the problem is that it's playing uh, the audio on the video here too. Uh, can I do that? No, ah, because right. it's, it's, if I lower it, then I lower myself also. Okay, so I'll try to lower it a little bit and then speak even louder myself. Yeah. Henry, would you mind going back uh, uh, 30 seconds or so is when it started oh. to, um, to, to not sound so good? Thank you. So he's being asked, what kind of savings have you seen in the real world? And he says, uh, head of 3D printing at Perry says that, well, because of the influence he has on the other trade, where everything can be prepared and so on, the electrician came in and he said, uh, we are going to say, say 12 days here. So you can see many savings inside the other trade because the printer has prepared everything. You don't have to touch on any socket or anything that's not been prepared. Henrik, I'm terribly sorry that it's um, it's still the audio is still a little bit patchy. I'm afraid it's uh, quite challenging to to hear what you're saying. in the end. Okay. Yeah, he says 3D printing will play a very important role. Oh, sorry. Yeah, let's just skip it because it becomes too complex with that uh, video. So, um, to give you uh, an executive summary, uh, to start with that, uh, we are globally the leading 3D construction printer provider. And what we do provide is robotic 3D construction printers based on on-site gantry printers capable of printing entire buildings, typically with a crew of only two people. Thereby, we are enabling faster, cheaper, and safer construction with more form freedom and use of less material. And in essence, all concrete applications can be addressed. So we are based here in Copenhagen, Denmark, but nonetheless, 50% of our team is international. So we have you know, all kinds of nationalities, Croatians, Lithuanians, Saudi Arabians, um, Germans, uh, whatever. Um, we have one advantage, as you can, uh, as you can see on my face, that uh, not only me but the CFO also, both of us are uh, in our 50s, and we have been brought up by blue chip Danish companies. So we know how it is to do big business uh, in the right way. Um, so we are not we are not a young startup of inexperienced people in, in that sense. And we have now uh, 40 employees, and our market is basically construction companies, windmill manufacturers, as you will hear about later and also engineering, procurement, and contracting companies. 
So these global companies that are more or less traveling around the whole world, so if they need a fertilizer plant in Mozambique or an oil plant, then these kind of companies come in and they take charge of everything. They secure the pipes, the concrete, the structures, etc. Et uh, real estate developers is also a large category of, of, uh, of, of our customers and then other heavy users of constructions and concrete applications. We also do sell to R&D institutions, including the university, and then I would say to entrepreneurial disruptors. And in general, our, our, our customer base is very global, so we have uh, customers on five continents, Asia, Middle East, Africa, Europe, and the US. We're only missing Latin and South America, but we're getting there. And we have a little bit of an, an unbeatable track record, because in 17, we 3D printed the first building in Europe, one floor building. Then in 19, our printers were used by the Belgian uh, company Campsi to 3D print the first two-story building in Europe. And then in 20, Perry, as you heard, used our printers to 3D print uh, the first three-story building. So the first one, two, and three-story buildings in Europe have all been, all been done by our technology. We also uh, 3D printed the first uh, villa in the uh, UAE. Unfortunately, because of COVID, it has not been revealed. It's a fantastic looking bill, villa, but have not been able to publish it yet. Then in 20, we also, our printers also 3D printed the first buildings in Africa. That was done uh, by the company 14 Trees, which is owned by Lafarge Holcim, which you might know is a very big uh, cement and concrete manufacturer, actually the biggest in the world. Then in India, our printers were used to 3D print the first two story building in India. And we ourselves, uh, on behalf of G, General Electric Renewables, have 3D printed the first uh, windmill tower base back in, in 19. We'll see some videos from, from some of these buildings in a second. Coming back to what I said in, uh, uh, originally, that the way we started this was in fact that we did three years research under a government grant. So we got a grant to travel around the whole world uh, to check out what is state of the art of this construction printing. Denmark is a little bit of a funny country. If we're not number one, two, and three on a, let's say, good ranking list, so, you know, who has the most, uh, the best digital performance, who are the most innovative or whatever, then we got nervous. Then we get nervous as a country. And the, the government was getting nervous that we were nowhere in construction printing. So they gave us and the biggest construction company, NCC, a grant to travel around the whole world, speak to everybody, and bring the best homes to the Danish construction so we did that uh, during a three-year research, and during the period, we also made a couple of test printers. We made some different recipes that we tested, and in total, we visited 38 different projects and organizations, and I personally visited 35. So I think in all modesty, I can say I'm the person in the world that has the, the most broad view of what the industry can do and what the companies can do. We also made two conferences. Number two turned out to be International, so we actually had to change the language from Danish to English. If you remember what I just said, this was made for the Danish construction sector. But nonetheless, at the second conference, 55% of all participants were actually international. We also written a report, the only report that has ever been written. Uh, it's outdated now, but it was written back in 17 of 108 pages. We obviously got many, many requests to translate it. We asked the government, and the government said, no, we are not translating into English because this was supposed to inform the Danish construction. And therefore, also because of this heavy research, we speak as experts all over the world at various uh, conferences. And then you can see here, we speak in US, France, Austria, Slovakia, Saudi Arabia, UAE. We speak in many, many uh, different countries. And as Alex were kind enough to point out, I am considered by some, maybe the blind, as one of the 10 most uh, influential in the entire 3D printing industry. So not just in construction printing, but covering also metal print and polymer print and so on. Right. So what actually happened after we did this research was that we decided that we were not terribly impressed by anything we've seen. And we said, I asked my guys, you know, we have been doing 3D printing uh, in, um, in many years, and we have guys that have been doing 3D printers for 20 years. So I asked my guys, can we do it better than what we've seen? Because we were not terribly impressed by the printers that we saw, technology-wise. And my guys say, heck yes, we can. I say, well, then let's go do it. And then we, we try. 
to do the to 3D print the first uh, building in Europe, and we did that in uh, back in 17. And you see a, a video of it here. Uh, we even put in 23% recycled content. Typically for us, we did it in the open. This is uh, the former mayor of Copenhagen. We had rolling TV cameras and 150 visitors. And you see a lot of the, the, the printing happening here. This was actually on the good days where we were printing. Two thirds of the days we were not printing because there were, there were issues with the, uh, with the printer. Um, so we, in fact, uh, made uh, many, many mistakes. And in total, it took uh, two months. So we were not really impressed. But, but hey, you know, this is not strange. Anything you do for the first time, you will not be expert in. Think about how it was when you learned how to drive a car. Were you an expert the first time? Hell no. Maybe by the fifth time or the tenth time, but definitely not by the first time. Um, right. Then uh, we won this project uh, with Imar. Uh, and if you know a little bit about real estate in Dubai, you know that you want to be in bed with Imar because that's the Shikes real estate company. And they've, for instance, done the 858 meter building. They've done the seven style real estate. And then in 19, our first customer, I'm seeing Belgium, uh, 3D printed uh, the first two-story building. And um, this, was, this was actually quite interesting because Kamsi is an innovation center. They don't have construction workers. So what they did was they went out to the university, found some students, we trained them in how the printer worked, and the, the, the students then 3D printed the building. So even if this is like science fiction technology, it is not more complex than students can, can be taught it, and they can then go print. Then uh, Perry, uh, uh, as I said, did uh, this uh, two-story building that we saw a little bit of before. I'll, I'll uh, show a, a short video of it also here. Um, and this, this uh, project has been thought out a lot in detail. They had been very careful planning, so they also printed uh, a round shower and a fireplace and, and, and things like that. Um, And this was not done for speed. This project was done for learning, so to say. So they notice everything uh, uh, down, and uh, they think about how they could improve it for next time for the for the next building they did. And then they went out to do the next building, which was a three-floor building, and it is actually the first commercial apartment building ever 3D printed. So this consists of five different apartments that are then being rented out. So the landlord will simply not sell the building, but he will rent out the, the buildings, which is very typical in, 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 in Germany to rent apartments like that. And you see the, the, the print going on here. You can see it's, it's a quite a, a big building. It's 380 uh, uh, square meters in total, so approximately 130 square meters on, on, on each floor. Uh, both in this project and the previous project, uh, Perry deliberately showed that it was 3D printed, meaning that you can see the, the layer lines of each print line. And normally we use, uh, we use uh, flaps um, for avoiding that you can see the lines, uh, but Perry chose to deliberately show that they were 3D printed. Then uh, last year, we also had another surprise because we started selling into the precast plants. And we thought that the precast plants were our competitors. Those were the guys we were competing against, but now they turned out to be customers. And what they want is, in fact, the same flexibility in terms of design and form freedom that we can we can have on site, but they also want to have that in their factory. Then by last year, uh, Lafarge and 14 Trees also 3D printed the, the first buildings in Africa, so uh, oh, a small house and uh, a school.
This was, in fact, another surprise. We we didn't really see it coming that uh, that our printers would be used in uh, in Africa, and we had an, a new one then by India because LNT Construction and LNT is the largest uh, construction company in India with 135,000 people. They printed uh, this building, which has 700 square feet, so 63 square meters, and it's two story. And it's located close to Chennai. And then here in um, in uh, 2021, Printed Farm Florida uh, printed uh, the first building of ours in the US. It's not the first 3D printed buildings in the US, but the first building of ours. Commercial agricultural building. So again, they chose to uh, to show it as 3D printed. Uh, uh, that uh, that appears to be like a, a tactic for a lot of our customers that they will make the first as 3D as with the look of 3D printed because that attracts the attention. And then later on, they will use the, the solutions that we have developed, where you hardly see the the lines, uh, the difference between the 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 the, the different printed layers. Back in 19, we also entered into a long-term cooperation with GE and Lafarge, proving that we could actually use this technology to make uh, wind turbine uh, generating towers, um, in a, a, enabling economically taller towers. So we printed, the first print that you will see here was 100 tons of concrete with no reinforcement, and it took three weeks. He was extremely satisfied uh, uh, with it because they didn't believe that we could do it. We, we were not, and we were a little bit disappointed about the time. Maybe the most interesting thing about this video is this guy over here. Look at what he's doing. This is the only guy you see working, right? Everything else is automated. And what he's actually doing, he's looking down at his phone, and now he's texting, texting his wife. Because the whole printing is, is fully automated. Now here in 2020, and I'm not at liberty to show to share a lot of details with you for GE, but we did it again. We printed another tower of 10 meters, and this time it uh, it was 175 tons, so it, it grew in size, and also had eight ton of reinforcement, and we cut down printing time to three days. So we went from three weeks to three days because we did it the second time, even if we did. 75% more, and also put in eight tons of reinforcement in the process, which was put in by the printer itself. So the printer put in the reinforcement into the concrete. Now, this is how our printer looks like. It's modular, consists of modules of uh, two and a half meters. So you can actually count the amount of logos here. will tell you how wide it is. And here there's six logos on. So six times two and a half meters gives 15 meters in the width which is also the maximum we can do. And here you, you have four modules in the height, so that's 10 meters. Whereas in the links, you can go as long as you like. And our printers are coming with 12 unique advantages. The first one is, of course, that you don't have to, you know, fit, fit the building to the printer. You fit, you fit the printer to the building because it's modular, so you just uh, 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 buy the size that you need. 
and then it's completely safe and EU certified. So it comes with a CE certificate and IP66. And IP66 means that it's safe to use in rain. So the printer will not be damaged from operating in rain. You can't do concreting work in rain. But what is important to know is that the printer will not uh, be damaged. So if it starts to rain, you just stop printing and the printer will be safe. And we have this uh, gigantic speed, which is uh, one meter per second. We haven't learned to fully control it yet. This is like having a Ferrari that can go 400 kilometers per hour, but you're only capable of maybe going 200 kilometers yourself. And we are right now at, when we do, when we have our best operators on, we are on 50 to 55 centimeters uh, per second. To give you an idea, this uh, one meter per second corresponds to 10 ton of material per hour. Now, to put that into perspective, if you look at the small little building of approximately 50 square meters that we did, the bot building back in 17, that had 20 ton. So with the full uh, utilization of the speed, we could 3D print that building in, in just two hours. And, and only, four, oh, only four operators are needed. And <laughs> it's not like we force people to uh, use any kind of uh, particular material. We are open source. As you've seen when from the videos, these are this is the highest quality machine. This is this is heavy duty construction equipment that we, we make. Among others, we're using German gears and motors. Then we have these flaps for smooth walls. I, I haven't shown you any videos of that, but I think I do have a picture later on of how it works. And then if you install the printer on concrete feet that sort of are set up uh, with as a, as a female, that means holes into it. You then come with the male part, which is the, the printer, and fit it into these concrete feet. You can actually set it up in four hours and take it down again in, in two or three hours. With us, there's no, again, no forcing of the, of the width of the printed wall that you want to have. You can just change the nozzle. You know, maybe print with five centimeter the first time you do a print. The next time you say, no, I'm, now I want to uh, print with 12 uh, centimeters. And the next time, maybe with eight centimeters. It's just a new nozzle. It's very easy. Um, and then we have a very flexible material feeding operation, which means that you can either do it industrial with a hose, or you can do it directly into the hopper, which means that you can develop new recipes that, that way. And then we have, of course, state-of-the-art software, and we can even accommodate for uneven services. The, the printer will automatically adjust for that. Now, you heard me say that the first time we did the bot building, it uh, it took two months and we were not satisfied because we were actually standing still quite a lot of the time. So based on that and based on that we had now more experience and a better printer, we took it upon ourselves to 3D print an exact copy. So it's exactly the same print that we did the first time, just in a warehouse this time because we were we were going to take it down anyway again and don't didn't need to ask for building permit if we did it inside. And here you see a, a video of that print. And uh, typically for us, we, we, we document uh, everything with numbers. You see a watch running at the, at the bottom. And uh, afterwards, you, you will see some key statistics from, uh, from this printing. Um, in essence, when things are going good, as it is, relatively speaking, on this video, there's not a lot of stoppage and so on. It's very boring to watch, right? Because it's just uh, running around the uh, uh, printing. But even in this print, we learned a lot. So on the total was 28 hours, as I said. So down from two months to 28 hours just. But on the third day, where we printed nine hours, we did more than 50% of the print. So the first 50% took 20 hours, and the last 50% took only nine hours. So we double up uh, productivity during the printing, which means had we printed with the, the productivity we had on the third day the whole time, we would have actually been done it, been able to do it in one and a half days. And here you see some of the the the, the, the details from the from the print. Right. So again, this has a lot to do with how it was uh, when you learned how to uh, ride a bike. Uh, so I'm making an analogy here and uh, sort of conveying it or translating it to to building prints. So the first time when you learn to to ride a bike, you were actually sitting down hurting your knee more than you were riding the bike because you were simply falling too much and you're hurting yourself. And that was the same thing as when we printed the bot building. We made lots of mistakes, so we were actually, actually standing still five weeks out of the two months. Then the next time you were riding a bike, you were 
feel insecure, but you were falling less and you were riding more. And that's exactly the same thing as with us. We uh, decreased the building time from two months to 28 hours. Now, by the fifth time you were running, uh, riding a bike, you were almost getting a hang of it. And that means in our uh, analogy, we believe that we would be down to eight to 10 hours uh, for printing that 50 square meter building. And by the 10 times you would be riding fast and we would be printing the bot building, the 50 square meters in just four to five hours. Notice I don't take it all the way down to two hours because that would require higher speed than we have been able to control so far. But four to five hours is the long term potential of, of the industry. Simply not because we are changing the technology, we're just learning how to master it. And in essence, in economic terms, this is what I'm showing here, that when you get scale, and when you get the learning effect, you move down the curve. And instead of having the cost up here, you will have cost down here. And when you have cost down there, you can disrupt the entire construction industry, which, as you know, is a very big industry. Here's a reminder. I, I usually ask a rhetorical question here. You know what this is, so I'll do this. Do you know what this is? And then I will provide the, the answer myself, other than the obvious answer, which is standing on it. It's a portable laptop from 83. But it's in fact my first laptop, my first uh, PC. Uh, and I was the top dog because I had two floppy drives. These were the things up here where you had floppy disk. That was your, your memory storage. And each of them had a 20, 128 kilobytes. And my good friend and the third biggest shareholder in, in the company here, he was hired by Mask, the shipping company, and he was the small dog because he only had one floppy drive of 128 kilobytes. To put that in perspective, an email with the word hi is 128 kilobytes. You would be out of memory with today's software. And hi and bye email would take me out of memory. With, uh, with that technology. But look what happened. Just six years later, I went to take my MBA from the US and I brought a portable laptop there, which is compact. And there, you started to see the kind of PCs or laptops that we know today. And it was very useful and, and really, really practical and, and uh, of course, meant huge productivity. And then later on, we saw less of a development, but we saw a new development with the MacBook Air coming where design suddenly were playing a role. Similar down here, this is one of the first uh, portable mobile phones. They weighed 20 kilos, they cost 5,000 pounds, and you could hardly call anybody. And very uh, curious, in fact, at that time, the, the leading 3D manufacturers of these uh, portable mobile phones, suitcase heavy, were all Danish. They were called Storno, Radiometer, and Dankhold. And each one of these were bought by huge electronic companies, so they were bought by Motorola, Ericsson, and Nokia. And look what happens. Just six years later, we got the first mass market phone, this Nokia phone here, which was the first mass market phone, and then suddenly you had an explosion in the sales of mobile phones, and then you had a, a similar explosion in, let's say, application and, and sales with this uh, iPhone when the iPhone came uh, 10 years later. But what I'm saying here, what I'm trying to show is that we are not here. Our technology is not that clumsy. Our first uh, printer was the Bud 1, but with the Bud 2, we are already over here. And with experience, we are coming into to this. So we will have this mass market uh, attractiveness and the ability to disrupt the entire 3D construction sector. This has to do with another thing, which is uh, what is known as the S-curve for the development of new technology. So you have here the achievement, how good are you? And you have how much effort have you put into it? And there are certain technologies. For instance, conventional construction, they are reaching their peak. So first they're born, then they see that with more and more effort being put in, they really increase the uh, performance a lot. But then at a certain point, no matter if you apply more and more performance, it sort of wears out. You don't get any marginal returns on, on whatever you put in there. And this is what we've seen in the conventional construction industry. Productivity in the conventional construction industry has been standing still for 30 years. That's why we see this quite strange development. If you compare a building 30 years ago and the cost of that relative to a cost of a car, they were almost the same price. But today, you can buy 10 cars for the cost of a building. 
simply because the car manufacturers had a lot of productivity gains, whereas the DC, the general contractors, had zero productivity gains using the conventional construction technology. Now, our technology that we have launched here, we might start lower because we are not so experienced. We haven't applied enough, enough effort, but the technology has the potential to go way beyond what we know from the conventional construction. We just have to put in more effort. And this is what is happening all over the world, not only by us, but mainly by our customers. This is our team, and hereby I conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henrik. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I myself have a couple of questions, so I'm, I'm going to get in there first. Uh, I was just wondering how you cater for outdoors applications, as you know, I imagine the vast majority of your applications are going to be outdoors. Sure. Uh, you know, do you, do you uh, compensate for um, dampness in the air, for example? And yep. uh, how do you deal with rain? You know, torrential downpours. Yeah, if if it starts to rain, it's like any construction activity. It stops. You stop. Because rain and concrete together, they have simply two things that you don't you don't want to mix up, right? Mm -hmm. So you can say the initial shrinkage and whatever will happen out outdoor in um, in in the printing. And yes, uh, ninety five percent of everything we do is being done uh, on site and outside. So on site, outside, um, and and that depends on the recipe. So you start by doing the recipe, you do some measurements on the recipe, and then you have the key figures for that recipe, and then you adjust for that with the way you print. I imagine different regions will have uh, different moisture contents of the air and, and, and different seasons as well. So I suppose that's going to be part of the learning curve Very for much the product so. development. And, and also during the day. So if, if a recipe requires a certain amount of water, you might need uh, less water in the beginning of the day. But in, when the at the middle of the day, when it's very, very warm, it cures much faster. So in order not to expedite the curing too much, you need to add a little bit more water and so on. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. I have uh, one question in the comments and, and then we'll put it to the, the, the other attendees in the meeting, see if they want to raise their hands. We have a question from uh, Charlie Oliver. He says, um, the 3D printed houses he is seeing on sale now are just as expensive as standard housing. Yeah. How do you expect the job market around 3D printing construction to evolve over the next four years? I imagine that's a, a cost bias question. Yeah, no, no, that's fair enough. And it's true. It is completely true. And I would even <laughs> claim, no, it's more expensive. It's been more expensive. And it has to do with the, the S curve that I showed you. The technology has the potential to do better. But the first time you apply the technology, it will be more expensive. The fifth time you do it, it will be the same cost and the 10 times it will be way lower. But you need to get the experience before you master. It's the same thing when you learn how to, to ride a bike. The first time, if you compare a guy walking and a guy learning how to ride a bike the first time, the guy walking would be faster than the guy learning how to ride a bike. He would also be faster the second time. The third time, they might be even. The fifth time, the bike would win a little bit. And the 10 times, the bike would win two times. Exactly same effect. So the, the Oliver is totally correct. That is the case, but it's because it's been done. The projects that have been done so far are one-offs, right? They do one building and then maybe in a totally different country, totally different project, another project is being done, but it's still a one-off. So we are right now trying to motivate our customers to look at projects with 10, 20, 30, 40 buildings, because that's where we will see the economics of scale and the learning effect. No, absolutely it makes complete sense. Um, I'm just conscious of the timing for the um, for our other present presenter, so um, I'll just take two more questions. A couple have popped up in the in the comments section. Uh, so we've got one from uh, Yilin Guo. Uh, apologies if I haven't said your name correctly. Um, what is the advantage of 3D printed building compared to prefabricated building techniques? Well, a lot of things. First of all, when you do prefabricated, you have to put in uh, have to put in reinforcement in everything. All part, otherwise you can't transport them. So you are forced to use more reinforcement than what is really needed from, let's say, the 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 from out of take from the building itself. Secondly, 
when you do it in elements, you have to put the elements together. So a typical cost relation between a precasted element, the cost price of that element, and the cost price of that element being finished into the building and the building being finished with the element is three times. So you add up first 100% for transporting it, training it on site, etc., and then another 100% of the original cost you add because you have to connect them and cast them together. That all cost we don't have. We just do it straight on on the building side, and we don't pay put elements together. Is that clear? And then of course also we when when you have precast uh, elements, you have certain forms. You have the uh, uh, you know molds that have a certain size. And if you ask for you know any other size than the size of the mold, sorry, five years delivery time and five times the price. They simply don't do it. If you ask them to do a funny curve thing or whatever. They don't do it. It, it. It's too expensive for them, and they can't make it. Whereas we, we don't care. The printer doesn't care what what form it is. We could even print. You know, uh, we've also suggested some of our customers. Okay, let's do twenty different houses where, let's say, the base uh, uh, construction methods are the same, but where we vary, for instance, the front of the building a little bit so that people get individual houses but based on the same construction method. So we get the advantage of scale, but we get the individuality of each house still at the same time. So fantastic. Thank you, Henrik. We're just going to take one more question and then we're going to move over to the next presenter. So this one's from Thomas Rosinski and he says, Henrik, how are the MEP services embedded into the printing? And does the printer leave a gap or is it manually placed uh, duct for future services. Yeah, both. Uh, so uh, if you if you are planning it in an advance like Perry is doing, then you simply make a hole when you're printing. You make sure that there's a hole made there, and that means that no cutouts have to be made, etc. We also suggest to the majority of our customers just pull the wires while you're at it, because you know you you have access to the voids, and typically it's printed. You put it in between two two walls, right? So you do double wall with a cavity in between, and you put it into the cavity so that it's hidden. And we 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 even tell our guys, our customers, do it do it while you're printing, and then just pull the wires. So what you need the electrician to do, because you're allowed to do this, you're allowed to pull wires, or you're not allowed to do where you need to an authorized electrician, and he's expensive, and he knows what to charge, and he'll show up when he likes, not when you need him, because he's scarce. And, and the plumber guy is the same thing, right? They are these authorized, you need special authorization in order to do these jobs. Well, what you need the electrician to do is only to connect to the grid, to connect to the electrical panel in the house and then connect that panel to the grid. So in essence, the, the, the 3D printing crew could do all the, 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 the wiring and so on without a need for an electrician. And then the electrician comes in when his specific skills are really needed which is, you know, uh, connecting these things into the grid and into the panel. No, that's um, really fascinating, actually, because I was wondering that for our members in SIPSI. Uh, absolutely. So Thomas has given a big thumbs up for that. So <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. Excellent answer. Um, Henrik, uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to move on to the next presenter, but um, thank you so much for that presentation. It was absolutely absolutely brilliant so um okay. yeah do, do, do you need me to stay am i allowed to leave because i knew call at eight o'clock <laughs> um yeah of course feel free to leave um of course henrik has said to us offline that he'd love to speak to anyone interested in collaboration so um if you'd like to reach out to him um you can go to the cobod website and contact him there yeah, but uh I mean. thank you very much henrik um you guys. much appreciated Okay, so if Henrik, you wouldn't mind uh, unsharing your screen. Um, my next presenter we're bringing to you today is uh, Dr. Alejandro Vélez Reyes, and um, he is an expert speaker that has been found from the SIPSI side. Now, he's going to talk to a little bit today around the applications of cutting edge technology. So I'll just give you a, a quick summary of his bio. Uh, Dr. Reyes is uh, innovating at the bleeding edge of academic research. Uh, he has secured funding from industry and government to develop new materials and design met methods in the 3D printed building sector. 
Uh, his work has been recognized internationally through publications and he is the lecturer of digital design and fabrication at the University of Plymouth. So uh, Dr. Reyes really is genuinely a thought leader in this space and um, we're absolutely thrilled to, to welcome him. So Dr. Reyes, if you'd like to take over and uh, share your screen, we'd be delighted to hear your presentation. Uh, that's great. Thank you very much, Alex. Let me just start sharing my screen just so you can confirm that everything's um, all right. Um, screen share. Uh, can you see my PowerPoint? Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, great. Um, well, thank you very much, um, Alex and Sam, for the invitation. Um, great to great to be here. I really, really appreciate um, all of you being here. If you happen to be based in the UK, I really appreciate that you are here listening to me instead of being in the pub, um, which happened today. So, um, thank you. Um, so uh, what I'm going to show you is a couple of uh, a couple of projects, a couple of things we're doing in the 3D printing space. Um, I have to say that uh, all, uh, Hendrik's presentation was, uh, of course, uh, very much geared towards the business side of things. This is more about the research side of things. Like, what are we investigating? How are we outlining those kind of research problems in the 3D printing space? But also, how are we starting to build? a body of knowledge that is based on local materials and conditions in the UK. So we have worked with uh, what you would call traditional materials. We have worked with the 3D printing of cob um, and the 3D printing of local clay blends in the southwest of England. So um, this this technique is actually called liquid deposition modeling, right? We, we, we print materials in a liquid paste kind of form. Um, Whereas large-scale construction 3D printing, as you saw before, is typically associated with a 3D printing technique called contour crafting. So there are different, you know, typologies of 3D printing basically, and 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 I think this shows an alternative, you know, way to think about materials and technology development in in academia. Um, as the same as Henrik, looking for collaborations as well. So if you have any question or you would like to follow up with questions and conversations after this presentation, please feel free to just drop me an email my email is on the screen as well so um well my name my name's uh, alejandro Redis. i'm a lecturer in digital design and fabrication in the university of plymouth um and my work spans across the overlaps between engineering and design and creative thinking so i'm, I'm an architect by training and i um specialize on digital design particularly from a digital fabrication perspective, and that involves reprinting, but also robotics, um, kind of built environment research and so on. Um, part of, uh, hello? Hello? Uh, we can hear you, can you hear Alejandro. Yes, okay. I can hear Great. you just fine. Yeah, sorry, I, I, uh, my, my laptop got stuck for a second there. Um, and that, that uh, work spans across both artistic, if you wish, creative expressions of 3D printing, working with local artists and designers, uh, as well as speculations, if you wish, uh, re, um, visualization of 3D printing at an architectural scale. We have printing build, printed building elements that I'm going to show you in a second, but um, there, is, there are changes in scales and levels of complexity, of course, involved in 3D printing uh, technology sector. So we have been exploring that in a quite kind of agnostic way, let's say, working with a range of disciplines, including mechanical engineering, design, fine arts, uh, etc. Um, and I also have a role as a guest tutor at the Bartlett in UCL, where I work with students doing their dissertations on architectural production or architectural robotics applications uh, using other techniques, not necessarily through printing. This is an example from incremental sheet metal forming at, um, at the Bartlett. Um, just to start, a little bit of background. You may have seen this before, or terrible, you know, digi digitization index. This is a famous McKinsey report that actually put construction at the very last, well, together with agriculture and hunting um, 
uh, digitization index in terms of how do we adopt technology, but also how that adoption is actually composed by a series of uh, factors, like how much we spend, you know, how much interaction we have with technology and so on, and they end up with this, you know, index that doesn't paint us under the best light, probably. Um, but in addition to that, I think there are, uh, we're just talking with Sam and Alex before this, this event actually about this, there are, there are other factors that actually are involved uh, or mediate, right, the way construction and the way we deliver buildings is, is mediated by technology. This is, for example, a series of case studies that I'm not going to detail very much really around the diffusion rates in our sector. That, that, that is the, the time that it takes for an innovation to be formulated all the way into until it's kind of adopted and it's and it's really interesting to see how it works you know in the uk beam for example this is not from mediation this is from the first time it was had until it was used for the first time in practice um uh, a study put it between in the region of around three years um however you can see how beam as a concept it was actually created right delivered in through research in 1978 so actually until its legal implementation in 2016 we have 38 years of lag right to to kind of adopt that technology um 3d printing actually as a concept as an idea right particularly in in plastic you know um it was actually formulated in the mid 40s so we're already 75 years into it <laughs> um however the specific uh, techniques more widely used in construction, such as contour crafting, were already in around 23 years, right, um, since it was originally formulated uh, at the University of Southern California, you know, in 1998. So I guess the point is we are, we are a bit slow, right, in, in formulating technology, and we are a bit slow on de-risking technology to adopt it a bit more widely in the sector, right? Um, um, in that space, our university has been working on actually two, two facilities specialized on digital fabrication and immersive media. Uh, I, I specialize on the digital fabrication side of things that are that sit at the heart of our of our faculty, you know, in our in our building in, in Plymouth. And and within this agenda, the, the aim is to facilitate the way technologies can support local business and basically grow this kind of creative digital design economy in the southwest so as an academic institution most of our work sits in uh, what you would consider early stage basic and applied research um, technology readiness levels one to three right those are usually funded by research councils in the uk and probably what henrik has shown us is is the work he's doing in adoption of that technology right like later stages of this scale, right, eight, nine, or even post-launch, you know, uh, adoption processes, and there is always this this big gap, right, around um, uh, what universities do and what businesses do, and how they actually um, engage in a meaningful way in order to make sure that technologies can be then developed, evaluated, and then translated into a valid, you know, sustainable business proposition. So what I'm going to show you is very early stage, it's very exploratory, um, but it's, you know, what is what is happening at the moment, at least in our institution, and how we're starting to build, you know, a body of evidence to then move on to uh, further kind of adoption stages. Um, and on that on that space, we happen to have won uh, an, an Epson Robotic Solutions Equipment Grant. We were the only team in the UK um, that actually won an equipment grant from Epson. It was a, a call all across uh, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, um, which which increased our capacity, you know, to deliver 3D printing projects through robotics technology, but more broadly, you know, to understand the use of robotics in the context of the creative sector, which was a huge um, step forward in our kind of research. And, and this is additionally supported by Plymouth and its uh, IMA Flower Project, which is a cultural development fund specifically targeted, right, to develop the use of digital technologies to drive growth in the local sector. Um, 
Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip this. This is part of our broader sort of networks that have kind of facilitated some of the work I'm gonna show you. But I think this is a quite key diagram, right? How would we do sit somewhere in between the STEM fields and the arts and design kind of uh, well arts and humanities sort of spaces and how and what STEAM really means. So there is a lot of kind of uh, problematization, if you wish, right? Kind of descriptions of what STEAM means. But I'm gonna use this diagram just to illustrate how these projects sit within an academic sort of framework, if you wish. Um, the first one is called Computing Craft, and it's a really interesting project because what we were trying to do was to learn how to deal with knowledge, not necessarily develop in academia. You know, when we build, when we make things, when we engage with materials with our hands, you know, those are not always kind of established, measurable, you know, research and making processes. So we need to start finding ways to engage with materials in more meaningful ways and start thinking about local skills, local sustainability, you know, how do we basically build these digital trajectories in consideration to our local environment and materials and skills. And I think that 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 maybe addresses to some extent the question that I can see in the chat by Charlie Oliver, but I can go back to that if you wish. Um, so what we did is that we chose, well, basically we chose a material, we chose cob, uh, which is a mix of subsoil, hay and, and, and water, subsoil that contains some, some clay. It is an exposed building of cob in, in Todnes in Southwest UK. Um, <clears throat> and the really beautiful thing about cob is that it really relies on its localized context, right? Subsoil has different characteristics, clays have different characteristics. So there's no one size fits all recipe to deal with these materials. So trying to understand how to engage with complex material processes through technologies like 3D printing is a really interesting way to not only, you know, um, develop new technological pathways, but additionally to better understand local ways of building, traditional ways of, of building that would otherwise be um, either lost or that are quite kind of peripheral to the industry really. Um, so we got a bit of money, uh, we team up with Cardiff University and a postdoctoral researcher from the, sorry, doctoral researcher from the University of Adelaide. And we got funding from EPSRC and their Connected Everything Network. We were the only design-led team in this project, um, uh, which was interesting. Um, and our methodology involved trying to understand this material and work with local material provision and local makers to develop new workflows, right? To position this old material, if you wish, within a contemporary sort of digital trajectory. And that involved testing things with either small arms or, and then developing an extrusion system to work with a large um, a 60 kilo payload arm located at the University of Cardiff. Uh, lots of tests, very systematic, trying to understand what are the structural requirements, mechanical requirements, trajectory planning requirements for a material like this, um, which is when we realized that basically the material was having none of it really. It's a very temperamental material. It's not a paste, it's not uniform, right? It's, it's full of bubbles and hay and gravel and sand, and it's really difficult to extrude. But trying to understand that materials are complex, I think is really relevant because um, Different, different concretes are also uh, quite diverse. You know, different different materials that you can print with are actually quite diverse. And getting further understanding about those complex material considerations would be definitely a contribution to the field. So what we eventually did was to develop our own bespoke extrusion system with two mechanical engineers um, and kind of uh, our colleagues at the University of Cardiff, based on a double kind of pump system and and. And this actually helped us not just to develop the extrusion system, but also to find localized sort of recipes, if you wish, material mixes that could be adapted and utilized to basically 3D print with really, really, really low cost material with almost no um, carbon footprint uh, whatsoever. Uh, this is the this is a scheme of the of the system that we ended up uh, developing after using a fair chunk of money on failed tests, as Hendrik said, lots of failure, lots of learning, um, uh, and but, but eventually the system was indeed sort of developed and, and published and we reached some quite interesting sort of material configurations that couldn't otherwise be achieved with certain more liquid mixes um, or more 
paste like mixes like cantilevers you know um uh, as well as inclination that you couldn't otherwise achieve through a 3xc standard sort of uh, gantry based 3d printing system so it's an interesting direction to think about what are the design opportunities you know the architectural opportunities arising from the use of systems like that particularly considering that once a system is developed the cost of operating that is is quite marginal actually it's, it's basically mud mud with hay um I, i'm gonna i'm gonna go back to 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 this project but um this is um a, a demonstration of working with six uh, axes beyond sort of three axes and it was um and this is actually the section of an arch you know it's a it's a building component uh, modeled after uh kind of uh, an, another building an arch kind of shaped uh, building component uh, roughly at the same time we got a little grant from research england uh funded through the southwest creative technology network aiming to study kind of automation in the creative sector and we team up with thomas duggan a local artist local designer from cornwall uh, again, going back to this graph, uh, this was a really interesting one because uh, Tom is, a, is, a, is an artist, is a, is a designer, and our, uh, through the Southwest Creative Technology Network, what we did was to provide technical expertise around robot programming and try to team up with him to better understand how certain materials can offer different creative, if you wish, artistic configurations. And we started working with local clay. Um, his practice is quite multidisciplinary, but it's also quite keen to adopt digital technology. So we managed to put our hands on a KUKA robotic arm with a bespoke kind of clay extrusion system. This is the robot and the coding environment using uh, rhinoceros that some of you might be familiar with in the ceramics workshop of our university. And what we started doing again was to start quite in a quite open-ended way to start testing the affordances of those materials against different 3D printing parameters. You know, printing small objects is actually quite difficult because the material is still fresh when you go through the second layer, basically. So learning what can you afford to do against different geometric and material configurations is the study that in this case is embodied through an artistic, you know, design design practice, but there are elements of material science and performance, you know, embedded in the way the study was conducted, including some uh, 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 models that made uh, reference to some form of architectural application through contour crafting approaches. But additionally, by generating, right, 3D printing tool paths, you know, how can we start acknowledging the material behavior on the way these trajectories are designed so we can enable larger furtherly um, uh, complex, if you wish, material configurations on the basis of a quite humble and low cost material as it is uh, clay. Uh, this is one of the sculptors that we developed, which was um, exhibited at the Tate uh, Museum. Um, this is when, uh, through our partnership, uh, the, the Tate came in, but also uh, Emery's came up in our radar, which is a material science company that developed a high performance clay blend specifically for 3D printing applications, which created a whole new sort of material science layer to this. Um, this is a clay blend that includes uh, certain contents of ethanol, and therefore you can print with it um, with further kind of heights because ethanol evaporates quicker than water so the the mix uh, gets harder basically quicker right than um, any other any other material and we managed to to print actually quite large and complex uh, objects this is a live printing installation at the Tate um, but what was really interesting was not necessarily the scale of the object obviously these are just kind of artifacts if you wish but the amount of data that we were able to uh, pass through the robot in order to enable this 3D printing um, process. You know, we started to to probe and basically poke at what is the degree of complexity we could achieve in terms of what are the material design considerations for these objects. And we managed to print with files of up to 30 to 35,000 points in the space, which, um, which is huge and probably um, larger than than any um, than any building really um, also because layers 
change on, on its height. This is not contracrafting. Um, um, and of course, there is a, a, an also a, a design aspect to this in terms of how to approach and, and look into the design and creative possibilities of these new material sort of languages, if you wish. Um, and to do that, we, we did a, a lot of surveying work, photographic work, uh, a lot of tests and a lot of artifacts actually um, through different sort of 3D printing techniques, but also managed to get our hands on a bit of time from the Electron Microscopy Center at the University of Plymouth in order to better understand that layering, right? That, the, the, that, that adhesion layer between different uh, layers of clay to better understand what happened there and how can we better improve right the mechanical or structural capacities of this specific material system and also we team up with a local company in, in launceston that were uh, that kindly kind of 3d scan to a very very high level of resolution these models for us in order to have this sort of dig digital archive of 3d printed media which then we used to um uh, deliver a small micro commission to the Plymouth Museum, the box, their COVID-19 micro commissions program, where we were able to use digital media to test basically and speculate on the architectural spatial implications of this type of technology in the context of 3D printing. Um, what are we up to now? This is uh, all this, these projects are, are, are finished. We still have a few kind of publications that are quite recent, but some things that we're up to now have to do with um, the, the basically look into the future for these technologies and how these technologies can serve a bit more specific purposes, not, not only in terms of product design or fine arts, but also how to scale them up, including architectural and construction applications. One of those approaches is what you're seeing on screen, uh, which involved the use of uh, generative and um, performance optimization tools to, in this case, reduce the amount of 3D printing time, how can we orient an object in space in order to reduce and optimize the way it's 3D printed. This is a very small model, of course, it is a, it is a mug. Um, but what you're seeing is actually the, the computer, right? Uh, thinking and testing basically different uh, proximal rotational configurations in order to minimize the amount of 3D printing work that you would need to do for, in this case, this specific uh, shape. So this is an algorithm that or we have kind of developed in-house as well. Um, but also from a design building perspective, really, um, the, the, the biggest shift here is moving from massing or mass-based, kind of volume-based models of structural uh, configurations to a filament-based model, uh, which is a huge shift uh, not only in terms of the design opportunities but also the mechanics and the structural um uh, requirements you know for a filament based um building model uh so one thing we did is to um not necessarily uh, go mainstream but um with a bit of funding from ciob what we did was to basically create the material of a uh, cop in in kind of a standard sort of or beam kind of autodesk environment um, but also we enabled right, those physical and thermal properties in the uh, simulation, let's say, of building components with uh, COPs, which now are, you know, fair game to other, you know, uh, beam uh, models and material systems, uh, which was a really interesting um, digital asset to own, if you wish. Um, but then again, the, the, one of the issues is, what about the relationship between 3D printed objects and the other layers of the building, right? Not just layering, but also services, installations. What happens if these this, this, um, 3D printed surfaces need some degree of uh, protection? What about the interaction with other building elements and so on? Um, so we um, looked into this. Um, at, at that time, we, I was really lucky to have a research visit to Chile, um, where there is a, a university with a construction robotics lab with this uh, massive piece of equipment that you can see in the photo. And they are also following a quite similar approach, looking not into, not just into the 3D printing trajectory planning, let's say, uh, side of research, but they're also developing 
uh, materials and looking into a series of material qualities and considerations um, to 3D print as one part of the building, right? What happens, what, what happens with the interaction between 3D printed components and other components? Um, the reason why Chile is an interesting context to investigate this is it, it's because it's a quite seismic country. So it is anticipated that 3D printed buildings by themselves uh, might nonetheless require some degree of structural uh, reinforcement or some additional degree of you know other building elements to basically support some uh, load bearing elements. Um, and this is actually one of the projects which is really, really interesting, um, is a mix actually between uh, a robotic and a gantry system uh, using a kind of cooperative robotics to 3D print uh, around other objects. In this case, these, these robots are printing around um, steel reinforcement in concrete objects. Um, and although what you are looking at your screens is a simulation, this is the actual proof of concept prototype is 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 already is already built. I was quite kind of quite lucky to to see it, and it's a really interesting approach around how to avoid collisions and how robots can cooperatively print something, acknowledging that other systems exist in the building as well. Um, and on that note, by the way, we happen to have in in our university now a studentship available. Um, to look into multi-robot 3D printing for large-scale manufacturing. So if you wish to contact me on that, feel free to drop me a line. Um, and, um, and the other kind of area that we looked into is elements of not just environmental sustainability around the use of COP that we, 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 we know is relatively, um, relatively low in terms of its environmental impact, but also what is the thermal performance of 3D printed COB and how can we start looking into not just the, the printing process or the extrusion process, but also how this process compares, you know, with, um, with the handmade version of the same material. So we team up with the um, built environment research team in our university led by Steve Goodhue and Peter De Wilde. Um, they happen to also run their own kind of masters in high performance buildings. Um, and what we did was to develop these these samples basically and i'm not going to go into all the details but in the graph that you see below you can actually see that the 3d printed samples the ones that are highlighted in the red triangles actually do quite well they can compare quite efficiently to to the handmade counterpart and it's really really interesting that um uh except for the solid one the 3d printed molds that have uh, uh, gaps in them, actually they do perform quite well, which means that the system can afford to have a series of uh, gaps or fillings to allow for additional layers or systems within the build kind of uh, fabric. So um, on that kind of trajectory of thinking what to do inside of these 3D printed objects, how can we use this, this filling strategies to think about um, other systems, for example, we do have also a studentship to look into lattice design, you know, what, what the lattice is in the interior structure, the reinforcement structures for large scale 3D printing to deliver through our master's program. Um, I think this is all from me. Thank you very much. Um, um, I can only see one question in the chat from Charlie Oliver. I don't know if I answer your question or not, but any other question is, of course, welcome. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro. That was a, a fascinating presentation. Um, yeah, if, if, let's go through some of the questions in the chat. Charlie Oliver's is the one that you picked out. How will 3D printing impact current construction industry jobs? If you only need one or two workers to monitor the printer. That's a small operation. Um, we actually got, uh, we actually had that question when, um, oh, sorry, my camera was off, apologies. Um, we actually had that question when we were awarded the funding for the COF project. And um, I, I think that definitely there is another project in there to really look into more details around employability dynamics. But um, what, what, what I would say is that the, the adoption of technology in our sector is not a new thing, right? It has happened before. Um, and there are shifts that we have witnessed already 
with areas such as computer aided design or building information modeling that they don't really replace jobs, but they reshape or reorient, if you wish, existing jobs. You know, the, the job of the BIM manager didn't exist until BIM became a thing, right? Um, but also in, in the area of robotics, uh, I think there is some sometimes a slight misconception about around um, these systems being autonomous because you might need people on site, but on the back of it, you still need programmers, you need people working on, on maintenance of machinery, you need experts on material science dealing with, uh, well, not just the material provision, let's say, but also the material blends and composites that you may use to, to print as well. So um, uh, I, I'm not sure to what extent um, that, that might make up, you know, numbers, if you wish. But um, but certainly um, it's not just two people. You know, you might need just two people on site, but you still need a wealth of skills and expertise on the background of these processes. Definitely. I cannot hear you, Alex. I'm not sure if you are muted or I cannot hear you for some reason. Yes, I, I was muted. Okay. Sorry, Alejandro. Yeah. We have another question from Yilin Guo. Is the material you use in the 3D printing could largely help reduce with carbon emissions? Because we all know the 17 targets we need to get in 2030 by the UN on climate change. Um, yes, um, I, I can actually... Um, I mean, we we know that the answer is yes, but um, we know that carb and, and clay, they are locally sourced. Um, they don't require intense uh, processes to uh, create its ingredients, if you wish. Um, but actually, if um, their same research team from Cardiff that help us, that we partner up with to deliver this project, they just published last year an environmental assessment paper comparing concrete and COP 3D printing in the Journal of Cleaner Production that has a lot more detail than I, what I could tell you now. So maybe if you send me an email, I'm happy to direct you to that paper. But but yes, it is a lower footprint, um, uh, lower carbon emission, not just uh, 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 in terms of its uh, material sourcing but all these materials were also locally sourced you know so things like transport and so on were actually much more um efficient um but yeah if you drop me a line i'm happy to send you to a paper with much more details yeah excellent um i have one question uh, if there's none others that are going to be asked in the presentation you showed a rig that had two robots Mm -hmm. And I think you said a vision system so that they could uh, prevent from colliding with each other. Has a, a similar kind of technology been used for compensation, online compensation? Um, I, don't, I know that um, yeah, there are, I haven't seen examples in large scale. Um, I have seen examples to small scale, industrial fusion deposition modeling 3D printers. Um, I think there is a series of Ultimaker printers, for example, that can actually measure the models they print and compare them with the digital counterpart to, to make sure that you keep some form of dimensional, you know, um, coherency. Um, I think there is some, um, that, that question, um, not, to, <laughs> not to overcomplicate things, but I think that question opens up the, the, uh, a window to discuss digital twins, um, not just in, 3D printing, but in construction more broadly as well, and, and how you can basically feed from a digital kind of sensing system to correct things as you go. Um, we, we did some correction ourselves uh, manually after we had a bit more information around things like shrinkage and stuff like that, um, but we didn't automate that. Um, I'm not sure that's a sensing, uh, sorry, I'm not sure that's a computer vision problem only it sounds like it could be more of a sensing um challenge but um we, we didn't do it we did it manually if you wish but uh, uh sure it sounds like something that could be could be explored there yeah it, that sounds very interesting uh, are there any further questions 
either raise your hand or stick the question in the chat. Okay, well, if there's no further questions, then um, I guess we'll wrap this one up. Um, as Dr. Rez said, uh, he's very keen for any collaborations. So if you can contact him on uh, through the Plymouth University website, um, I'm sure he'd be more than happy to discuss collaborative opportunities. And of course, we'd like to express sincere thanks to Dr. Reyes for giving us his time today and giving such an interesting uh, presentation. So I hope you've all enjoyed that uh, from Sibsi and the IET. I uh, would like to wish you goodbye. And this presentation should be on YouTube channels uh, in the near future. So thank you very much for attending and uh, we'll see you soon. Goodbye. <laughs>